was I mentioned this morning, and then it was on your uh, bullets, and tonight I want to talk about um, biblical meditation. And of course, I've got to put the biblical in front of meditation, because the world knows of meditation, but they know of, a, uh, of another very different kind of meditation called New Age meditation, or just worldly meditation. Uh, and we'll get into the differences a little bit later. It's one of my soapboxes. Every once in a while, I like to pull this subject out uh, because I do believe it is um, the, the key to the Christian life. Uh, the, the key to holiness and happiness is uh, uh, not just understanding meditation, understanding meditation, but obviously practicing meditation. And so I, I want us to I think about that tonight. And I want to do so in the context of mortification, just as an example of uh, the benefits of uh, meditation. So I'll start off with mortification and then we'll transition into uh, meditation. So take your Bible just to begin with to uh, Colossians chapter 3. There's really only three places in the New Testament, uh, explicit places, uh, that speak of mortification. There's probably some other text that it kind of implies mortification, but these are the three texts uh, that directly um, bring your attention to uh, really the command that we must mortify our flesh, uh, the deeds in our flesh. Um, and I'll work our way backwards from uh, Colossians, then to Romans, and then back to what uh, Ray read earlier in Matthew 5. So just um, a little Bible study to begin with and move in your Bible so you don't fall asleep. Colossians chapter 3, you see there in verse 5, Paul simply says, therefore, and of course the therefore uh, is there uh, for, um, based on verses 1 to 4, which basically means if you are in Christ, if you've been raised with Christ, you've died with Christ, um, you're in Christ, therefore there has a, a, a meaning, and that is if you're in Christ, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. Uh, so just if you stop there for a moment, put to death, that's, that's where we get the word mortify. Put to death. That, and mortify, of course, is the old reformers, Puritan word, uh, and, and how they uh, translated or understood putting to death. Put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. And what is that? Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Uh, because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. So we knew all about those before we were a Christian. And even as a Christian, we probably struggle with some of those. But if you know that you are in Christ, then you have an obligation to put to death those deeds, those sins in your body. Obviously, the question comes, well, how do you do that? And we'll talk about that. But for now, uh, turn back to Romans chapter 8, just to see another text that speaks of the idea of mortifying your sin. And here in Romans 8, verse 13, in this middle of this phenomenal chapter of Romans chapter 8, Paul says there, uh, I'll start with verse 12 just to get to the full flow. So then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh. We don't live by the flesh anymore. We're not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Why? Because if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So there in one verse, really two verses, you have an option. You live according to the flesh, you're going to die. Uh, you put to death by the Spirit, you're going to live. Uh, and so again, we see this exhortation, this command that we must put to death the deeds of the flesh. Now go back to Matthew 5. Matthew 5 from where Paul, Paul, that's not your name, is it? Ray, Ray read for us earlier. It's sometimes mistaken for the Apostle Paul. So, um, it comes in verses 29 to 30. You notice Matthew chapter 5. Uh, and by the way, just to, to preface before I read it, uh, remember, this is the Sermon on the Mount. And we, we all know about the Sermon on the Mount. It's Jesus going on a mount and eyeballing his, his disciples and teaching them. Um, 
So all the instructions in the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5 and Matthew 7 is, is about Christians and how they are to live in the kingdom of Christ. And what I find absolutely remarkable at this point is, in the eyeballing of his disciples, is, is these comments. Let me read it. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Um, Those are pretty strong words, I would say. Uh, Those those are words are basically, uh, if you don't deal with your sin, you're going to hell. And again, he's talking to Christians. If you do not get a handle on your life, if you don't get a handle on mortifying the sins in your body, I'm going to throw you into hell. He says it a little bit stronger over in, if you can't believe that, a little even bit stronger over in Mark, uh, Mark 9, I believe, but we won't take you over there. But uh, this is what Jesus is saying. This is your relationship. If you're a Christian, this is your relationship uh, to sin. This is what you do with indwelling and remaining sin. You put it to death, or in the words of Jesus here, you pluck it out. You, you cut it off. Now, before we even talk about meditation, I hope you understand that that's your duty and that's your obligation. As Christians, you pluck out the sin in your life. You cut out the sin in your life. You put the death, the deeds of the body in your life. And, and again, he, he's talking to you if you're a Christian. This is all for Christians in, in, in a soundbite, get serious about sin or go to hell. That, that's what he's saying here in a nutshell. But as I said earlier, uh, how, how do you do that? If, if this is that serious, then I better know how to pluck out, gouge out, cut off, put to death. Or, you know, one of the best illustrations of what it looks like in putting to death the deeds of the flesh uh, and you may have heard this before, is, is the story there in 1 Samuel 15 where um, Saul, uh, sorry, Samuel tells Saul um, to, to, to capture uh, Amalek, any Amalekites, and do what with them all? Cut them all off. Wipe them all off. Kill them all. Remember? And then next time Samuel comes around, he's like, what's that bleeding of the sheep I hear? I thought I told you to wipe out everything, even sheep. Uh, better to obey than to sacrifice because Saul's reply was, well, I, don't know, I kept some of the best stuff for me and come to find out I, I kept the king uh, um, um, uh, Amalek over here because, you know, he's my prized trophy and so he used to rub it in his nose and to show the people um, how blessed we are. I decided to keep him around and, Saul, uh, and Samuel turns around and says, no, 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 better obey to sacrifice. You should have killed him. Bring Amalek, uh, Amalek out here and what does Samuel end up doing? He hacks Amalek, Amalek, two pieces in front of the Lord. Remember that? You want to make a movie on that? I'd love to see that. Take, take the King Amalek, I don't know why I'm in trouble saying it, uh, King Amalek, and, and not Saul, not a soldier, but the prophet Samuel hacks him to pieces. Now, he could have said he just chopped off his head or, you know, shot a bow and arrow in, into his heart, but hacked him to pieces. My point, of course, is that that's a vivid illustration of what we're supposed to do with our sin. We, we are to hack it to pieces. But how do we do that? How do we do that? Now, if you picked up on Paul in Romans 8, he, he, he did give us a little bit of a window, a little bit of a clue. He said, how? By the by the Spirit. Well, that goes without saying. If you're going to do anything spiritual, it's got to be done by the Spirit. You yourself cannot hack your sin to pieces. You're going to need some divine help. And so it's by the Spirit. And the Spirit helps us to kill sin. But that doesn't necessarily tell us what our responsibility Sorry, it does tell us what our responsibility is, um, but it doesn't tell us exactly how to do that. And so the question, as I said, that comes up is what are our God-given means by which we mortify sin and pursue holiness? What do we do? What do we do? Now, by the Spirit actually gives us a a bit of a clue. 
If you know anything about the Christian life, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you understand uh, that the Spirit of God only works with what? The Word of God. The Word of God in the hands of the Spirit of God is, is what saves us, is what sanctifies us, what transforms us, what conforms us. So if, if Paul says, by the Spirit of God, mortify your sin, that automatically tells me that the Spirit of God never works in and independent from the Word of God. So we use the Word of God. As I said, it's the Word of God in the hands of the Spirit of God that are the means by which we are saved, and not just saved, but we are sanctified. Mortification is part of the sanctifying process. And, and I'll just say, just as a footnote, you, you better understand that if you've not understood that. If you don't understand uh, that the Word of God and the Spirit of God, not Word of God and the Spirit of God, or rather the Word of God or the Spirit of God, it's Word of the God and the Spirit of God, you're going to run up with all sorts of uh, false methodologies and even heresies. It's always the Word of God and the Spirit the Spirit of God. Those are God's soul-sufficient means for the salvation of souls and the sanctification of the saints. The Word of God and the Spirit of God, all right? That is the means for, for, for everything. And as I said, mortification comes under the category of sanctification. Now, I, I trust that's a reminder. Hopefully it's a good reminder. I trust that you know that. Uh, I know that you know that the Bible is authoritative. I know that you believe that the Bible is sufficient for our lives. Um, but I, where I think most Christians don't fully understand or um, and for whatever reason they, they, they don't understand, but they haven't um, not just comprehended but necessarily taken the next step and applied is how do you use the Word of God in your life? Uh, in other words, I think genuine Bible-believing church Christians, and you probably can't be a Christian without saying this, is that the Bible is um, sufficient, um, sorry, uh, inspired, the Bible is inerrant. Um, there might be a bit of a question mark on some Christians whether they think it's sufficient because they seem to find all sorts of reasons uh, to fix problems instead of the Bible. But let's just say they do find it sufficient as well. And so they tick that box, they tick the inerrancy box, they take the inspiration box, they take the tick the sufficiency box, but, but, but then what's the next step after that? Yes, 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 but the Bible's over here. They don't use it. I don't think most Christians know how to use the Word of God with the Spirit of God in order to have their lives transformed, um, to pursue righteousness, to pursue godliness, or even here, to mortify their sin. So that's what I want to talk about, because when we talk about how to use the Bible, what comes in is what? Meditation. Remember Paul in, in Colossians 3, uh, when he says to mortify the, or put to death, uh, a little bit later he says, let the word of God do what? Dwell richly in you. And there's a bit of a help on how to mortify sin. Let the word of God dwell richly with you. But most Christians, as I say, they might give lip service on the Bible and, and, and maybe they, they, they come to church and they listen to a sermon and they think, well, that's all I need to do. There's one box, two boxes to tick. And then Monday through Saturday, maybe, you know, they download four or five sermons and they listen to sermons all day. So, uh, they go to church, they listen to a sermon, maybe Sunday morning, Sunday night. Um, maybe they download sermons and listen to sermons all week. Maybe they even read their Bibles throughout the week. You know, they had that little Bible reading plan where they read, you know, one Old Testament verse, one New Testament verse, a psalm and a proverb. Um, and they think that's it. That's, that's the Christian life, isn't it? I mean, that's what I've always grown up in. That's always what I heard. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying those things are wrong. Do those things. Have a Bible reading plan. Listen to sermons. But you've got to do more than that. You've got to learn how to meditate on Scripture. In fact, the Bible never tells us actually to read Scripture. It tells us to what? Meditate on Scripture. Meditate on it day and night. 
So this is why we, we need to understand the importance of meditation uh, because it's not just what we need in order to mortify sin, but it's really what we do in order to live the whole Christian life. As I said, most people just listen to sermons all day, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but that's not meditation. What is meditation? Well, let's, let's, let's talk about that. What is med meditation? And, and this is where we'll turn for the rest of our time tonight, and I really only have uh, two points, two points, and, and you can see that on the uh, on the bulletin, we're just going to talk about the definition. First, we need to define meditation. We really need to make sure we understand what biblical meditation is. And after we define it and understand what meditation is, then we'll talk about how to use it, okay? Uh, uh, you know, or, or what are the benefits are, the div dividends, so to speak. So let's start with the definition. What exactly is biblical meditation? And a good place to start is Psalm 19. I'm not going to have you turn everywhere. Uh, tonight, sometimes I just read it, but here's one place where I think it's good for you to see uh, right, right there and before you what meditation is. So Psalm 19, David writes, look at verse 14, right at the end of the psalm. He says this, let the words of my mouth, and then what? The meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So the words there, what do I know about it just in this verse? All right, before we even get to the Hebrew. One of the things uh, we've talked about over the years when we read the Old Testament and certainly in the Psalms, but even the prophets, uh, there, there's a particular type of way that the Hebrews would write. Uh, there would be prose, which is narrative, and then there would be poetry. And in poetry, the way they wrote poetry is by um, what we would call parallelisms. Most of the, the poetry is most, not all the time. There's some, some um, other ways to do it. But most of the time, in parallelisms, it's just two lines you look at. Proverbs are very much this, where there'd be one line and then a second line, and they're related. In other words, the writer writes it one way, and then he turns around and writes it another way, but it, both lines are getting to the one point. Sometimes that second line will be different than the first line. Sometimes that second line will kind of finish what was said in the first line, but most of the time, that second line will just repeat the first line, but in a different way. This is a case of that similar or synonymous parallelism. He says, let the words of my mouth, right? What's that parallel to? The second line, the meditation of my heart. So whatever the meditation of my heart means, you look up above and it means the words of my mouth. And, and that, that's why I begin here because this is the most basic idea of what meditation is. Meditation simply means and this is getting to the Hebrew, and I'll mention the word in a moment, something that is uttered out loud. Now, it's very foreign to us in our Western world, but in a Semitic, Eastern kind of a mindset, that, that, that's what they did. There was no such thing as reading uh, and reading silently. You would, when you read, you read out loud. When you, you, when you thought, you sometimes thought out loud, which obviously makes you look a bit crazy, but that's what you expected. I mean, you take Hannah. Hannah's troubled. She's in the, in the temple, uh, and she's, she's praying the, that the, the, the Lord would give her a son. And um, in her prayer, her lips are moving, but what's coming out? Nothing. The expectation was that words would have been coming out. Hence Samuel, or, or Eli rather, um, rebukes her, thinking that she's drunk. The expectation is that when she prayed, words would were coming out. When people read, the expectation were that words were coming out. That's meditation. Meditation is something that is uttered out loud. Now, of course, it doesn't have to be uttered out loud, but that's the meaning, the root meaning of what it, meditation is. The word is haga. <laughs> haga. Um, it's one of those words that uh, haga, haga. It kind of sounds like you're utter, just, just like uttering something out loud. Um, if you go back just a few 
Psalms to Psalm 1. Of course, apart from Psalm 19, the other familiar psalm that speaks of meditation is Psalm 1. And you remember, it's the blessed man who does what? Hagaz. Meditates on Torah, on the word of God, day and night. And so Haga, you can translate meditation, but it literally means mutter, utter, growl, moan. Again, the idea is speaking out loud. Now, if you have any Jewish friends, and uh, at, at Passover every year, uh, the family gathers around, the father uh, reads the story of the Exodus, and he tells the story of the Exodus in a book called the, anybody know? Haggadah. I think I'm pronouncing it right. The Haggadah. And you can hear Haggadah in Haggadah. And Haggadah literally means the telling. The telling. Or, or the declaring. And this is where meditation, uh, the idea of meditation comes from, to declare, to tell, to speak. Now, if you're in Psalm 1, you'll notice in Psalm 2, even though it's not translated in meditation, the word's actually in there, Haggah's in there. If you go over where it says, why do the nations rage and the peoples, what? You might have plot or scheme. The actual word is Haggah. Here's, here's this picture of Yahweh and his anointed over here and all these wicked people over here. And what are the wicked people doing? They're plotting and scheming and they're plotting and scheming, meditating, speaking out loud, chewing over how they're going to do what? how they're going to go against Yahweh and his anointed. And, of course, it's pretty foolish why Yahweh then turns around and laughs, scoffs at all of it. In fact, you notice what it says. They plot and meditate a vain thing. How vain is it? Trying to come up with a scheme to overthrow Yahweh and his anointed. But that's the idea. That's the idea. Talking out loud, musing over, uh, chewing over might even uh, uh, be a, a better idea. And of course, another illustration is the cow. The cow goes out to the grass, it chews the grass, he swallows it, but then he does what? He regurgitates it back up, he chews it some more, he swallows it, and he does that a number of times, right? That's meditation. That is what you're supposed to do with the Word of God. You read it. You chew over it, you might swallow it, bring it back up, chew it some more. Just, just reading a, a, a verse in the Old Testament, a verse in the New Testament, a, a, a psalm, a proverb, and then close your Bible, and then you're out the door on your way, that, that really hadn't done a lot. Because I bet you, by the time you got in your car and you drive around the corner, you've completely forgotten what you read. But chewing it over, Chewing it over. Now, I, I, this has been, as I said earlier, a soapbox of mine, and so I have tried to come up with ways to best understand meditation, and I call it, and you might have heard me say this before, I call it prayerful reading. Prayerful reading or prayerful planning. Prayerful planning. And the reason why I call it that is because meditation is a spiritual exercise and the means not only by which we mortify sin and pursue holiness, but also how we commune with God. What do I mean by that? Prayerful reading, well, you do open your Bible and you do read it, but in meditation, in, in chewing over it, you understand that God is speaking to you, but then you turn around and do what? You speak right back to him. You're having a dialogue with God by the Spirit through the Word. Now, if you're getting some audible voice with God, and then we need to talk. But the way God talks is through his Word, right? And we always say that. We're going to hear from the Word of God tonight. Uh, we're going to hear from God tonight, so open up, your, open up your Bible. God is speaking to you in his Word, and you speak back to him. That's what I call prayerful reading. That's why most of the time, and I don't know, and look, this is a, a, a personal thing, um, but I always read the Bible with a pen and paper in my hand. I, actually, I don't read anything, whether it's the Bible or any book, without a paper, uh, a, a notebook and pen. Why? Because as I'm reading, I'm meditating, and as I'm meditating, uh, the, the, the Spirit of God is bringing to mind understanding, and I want to make sure I remember that understanding, and so I'll jot it down. Some of you 
grow up on Blue's Clues? Remember Blue's Clues? Blue's Clues is he would get his thinking pad and sit in his thinking chair and, and figure the whole thing out. But that's what I do. I grab my Bible, I go into my thinking chair with my thinking pad, my meditation pad, my meditation pen, uh, uh, pad and, and chair, and just start musing, chewing over, thinking out loud. And I'm not a very good devotional reader because I just read one verse and my mind just explodes. I want to know what that word means in the Hebrew. And then once I find out what that word is, then it, my, it, my mind goes off this. Oh, I know where that word is. And I'll go to that text and I'll go to that text. And then I want to know what that means. And then I'll pull off the commentator, uh, commentary. And then an hour goes by and I've only read, what, a half a verse. But boy, did I get a lot out of that half a verse because I chewed over it. And by the way, as a footnote, that's how you learn. You, you, you learn two ways. You, you learn by teaching others, right? We've said that, disciple somebody. If, you, if you, you've been a Christian all these years and you think you don't know anything, ask yourself, who have I discipled? Because in discipling, you have to pass on what you've learned. And in passing it on and in teaching, you remember. The second way is by doing your own self-study Bible study. If you just listen to sermons all day, you're getting somebody else to do your sermon, your study for you. You're getting somebody else to do your meditation for you. But if um, you just read the Bible on your own and meditate on, on your own, then you're going to remember heaps more. So prayerful reading. The other thing I said was prayerful planning. Prayerful, prayerful planning, and by that I mean that we should be purposeful in our meditation. We, we meditate, we chew over, uh, the, the Spirit of God illuminates, it gives us understanding, and the question is, well, what do I do with all this? I, I remember working for uh, Wells Fargo Bank out there in L.A. during really during high school and college and seminary before I moved to Australia. And working for the bank, I was a, a financial advisor. I, 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 you know, I got my Series 6, my Series 7, my Series 63, uh, my insurance license to sell news. I, I was a stockbroker, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, and I remember every Monday morning, all, all of us, because we had different branches that we looked after, all of us would come to, to the head office for an early Monday morning and uh, we would uh, hear of uh, this new mutual fund or this new stock that just been announced, and, and we would be told all of um, all the information about this stock and how good it is, and 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 then really who who it would be best sold to, who what cust what type of customer would really want to buy this. And so after you get all that information, the next question is, well, what do I do with all of it? Well, you go to your office and you pull out your your book, and you look through all your customers, and you think, ah, Mr. So-and-so would do that. So you get on the phone, and you call him, and you, you, you try to sell it to him. Or so-and-so, you sell it to him. Not, you know, maybe the best illustration, but it comes to mind in that what we did was we sat in a room, we discussed it, we meditate on it, and then we planned something with it. That's what I mean by prayerful planning. And in many ways, you do that every single morning. You meditate on Scripture. The Spirit of God illuminates your understanding. And then you, you, you might even have your diary right next to it. And you say, well, you know what? i, I got to go to work today, and i got to meet so-and-so. Or I have a, a coffee with so-and-so, and, and I, I, I need help. I need help talking to that person, uh, whether it's evangelism or confrontation. And so your meditation is helping you plan what to do in that situation. Meditation then becomes a what? A, a strategy. A, a, a strategy to face all of life's problems. No wonder you are to meditate day and night. Does that make sense? And by the way, uh, meditation is just not an Old Testament thing. I know uh, we, we go to Psalm 1, we go to Psalm 19. Um, we can even go to Joshua 1 where he says, meditate on this book day and night so you'll have a success. But it's also a New Testament thing. Uh, last week, you don't have to turn there for this. Remember last week, last Sunday morning in Philippians 4, 8, we, we were told that uh, by Paul to think on these things, those things that are true, those things that are noble, those things that are just, that are pure. Remember that little list? Think and meditate are the same thing. Think on those things. The Greek word is logizomai, 
which means to give careful thought to a matter, to think about, to consider, to ponder, let one's mind dwell. You can translate it, meditate as well. Hebrews 12.3, just listen to this, the writer of Hebrews says, consider the sufferings of Christ. Same thing, same idea, consider. In fact, the whole, if you didn't even use the word, but as we've been going through the book of Hebrews, the whole message of Hebrew is to consider who? Christ. Consider Christ, consider Christ. Even Hebrews 10, 24, 25, consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. In other words, and I've said this before, when you come to church on a Sunday, uh, you, you are considering Christ, but you're also considering Christ's people. And consider has the idea is, uh, you actually have to do some work with your mind on how you can stir one another up in good deeds. Yes, we're told to love one another, but... You say, well, nobody tells me how to love one another. Well, maybe you need to meditate on what, how, how to do that. Chew on that. Lord, give me some understanding. How can I love so-and-so this week? How can I stir someone up this, uh, in love and good, in good deeds this week? With most things, you just don't roll out of bed and it happens. You have to do some work. As we said last week, it, sometimes it's some, some mind works. Some thinking work. By the way, that word consider is um, the same word we see in James 1. Uh, and, the, and the word has um, the, the, the word lead into it where you, 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 you think through and, and lead yourself to a particular conclusion. So in James 1, Consider it all joy when you con consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Trials aren't fun. Trials are pretty sorrowful. The the pain, the hurt, but you do some mind work in it because you know where it all is going to lead. It's it's going to lead to God's glory and to your good. And there, there's the joy that lies in all of that. I, I think I think you get the understanding of what meditation means. So many synonyms. What do we say? Musing over, thinking over pondering over, considering, even the word remembering. Um, of course, if you like kitchen metaphor, metaphors, uh, then simmering, <laughs> simmering over. Um, I mean, chewing over is a kitchen metaphor, but simmering over, sauteing over, stewing over, marinating over, all, all of those work. So I think you get the idea. So let, let's move on uh, from the definition to the, the dividends. What, what are the benefits of it? And by the way, let me read you Thomas' definition before we do that. Here's Thomas Watson's own definition of meditation. He says, meditation is a holy exercise of the mind whereby we bring the truths of God to remembrance and do seriously ponder upon them and apply them to ourselves, end quote. Now, I, I read that after I had thought, that's exactly what meditation is, is prayerful reading, prayerful planning. And that's, as, as I said, what Thomas Watson, uh, how he defines it. An another Puritan, just so you can see that I'm not alone in all these uh, ideas. Uh, Puritan John Ball says, meditation is a serious, earnest, and purposed musing upon some point of Christian instruction, tending to lead us forward toward the kingdom of heaven and serving our daily strengthening against the flesh, the world, and the devil, end quote. Now, when I wrap up at the end here, remind me, I've, I brought up some some books, if this piques your interest and you want to do some further reading, and, and, and it, it, there's one group of people who mastered not only the understanding, but the practice of meditation, it was the Puritans. If you have ever read the Puritans and you want to know why they seem to go on and on and on and on, very verbose about anything, it's because that was the consequences of their musing. They just mused on a particular uh, verse and they just thought of everything that came out of that verse. They left no stone unturned. That's deep thinking that resulted in great doctrine and very experiential living. But as I said, let's move on. Let's, let's move on to the, the dividends. Here is why you must practice biblical definition, def, uh, meditation. Now, you understand what it means. Let's talk about what meditation does. 
and, and I just jotted down, again, with my thinking pad and my thinking chair, uh, just a number of things. And, and, and there could be more than what I've given. In fact, I, had, I looked at some of these books this afternoon, and I missed a whole lot. But what I have here is, I think, is enough to get you started. But here's number one. What does meditation do? Well, first of all, meditation renews our mind. Re renews our mind. You'll know Romans chapter 12, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. And transformed has the idea of change. It's the word metamorphosi, where we get the word metamorphosis. And it's to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So how does that happen? How do we go from being conformed to the world to be having our minds being renewed and transformed into the Jesus, to Jesus Christ? Well, it only happens by how? Uh, by the word of God in the hands of the Spirit of God. And that comes with meditation. So, meditation renews our mind. Secondly, on the heels of that, uh, not only does meditation renew our mind, it, 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 it transforms our, our being. Let's just say it that way. It transforms our being. Let, let me have you look at a very familiar text, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Remember this? 2 Corinthians 3.18. We, Paul says, 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with unveiled face, and he's, he's contrasting Moses a few verses up who, when he, when he came into the presence of God, he had a what? He had a veiled face. But now in the new covenant, unveiled face, we all with unveiled faces are, and depending on what your translation is, are looking as in a mirror. And what's the mirror? The mirror is scripture, right? The glory of God, is, God's in heaven in his glory. Uh, we're not there, but the word of God is kind of like a satellite receiver where God's glory is coming down and it's bouncing off the pages of scripture. And as we look into it, or as we meditate on it, something happens to us. Notice what it is. Our being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. So you see the Spirit there. You see the mirror, which is the Word of God. And as you meditate on the Scripture, something happens. Number one, it renews your mind. Second of all, it transforms you. Transforms you into who? The same image the image of Christ from glory to glory. In other words, as you meditate on scripture and the spirit of God takes that meditation, he moves you from one level of glory to next. That sanctification process to ultimately you're glorified. What else? Number three. Meditation not only renews our minds, meditation also washes and purifies our mind. Uh, similar to what we said this morning. Jesus in John 17, 17 says, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify has the idea of washing. Sanctify has the uh, idea of cleansing and purifying. And Jesus says, well, the means of that is what? It's the word of God. If you want to be sanctified, uh, and sanctified especially in our minds, you want to get all that garbage that's in there out, well, you need to wash it. And you wash it with the word. Replace all that junk with truth. And meditation does that. Number four, not only does meditation sanctify our minds and purifies our minds, but it also guards our mind. It guards our mind. Go over to Psalm 119. And I'll have you just camp out on Psalm 119 for a moment because there's a, a few points that come out of Psalm 19. But in Psalm 119, verse 9, and, and this is the classic text on purity. Psalm 119, verse 9 says, How, or what are the means, can a young man keep his way pure? A, a young man wants to keep his way pure. How does that happen? Well, here it is. By keeping it according to to your word. So that's why I say, what does meditation do? It guards our minds. It sanctifies our minds. It renews our minds. It transforms our being. You want to be holy? You want to be godly? You want to be pure? You keep it according to your word. And that's going to take meditation. That's going to keep, take medita uh, meditation. 
Now, in verse 10, we come to our, our next point, and that is simply to know God. You want to know God? Meditate on the Word of God, because the only place you're going to find out who God is, is in the Word of God. You guys ever read Stephen Charnock's uh, The Existence and Attributes of God? You've heard of it? Two-volume work? He's, he was a Puritan. It's one of the f first two volumes that were given to me when I was a Christian. Uh, and over the years, I've pulled it off and, and read it, but w the story that I heard how it was put together, and I, I think this is true, I mean, I haven't heard anything different, is that Stephen Charnock, in his morning devotions, or morning meditation, as he was reading scripture, he would be jotting down everything that he'd learned. And over the course of, if not weeks, and months, and years, he's, he's, he or somebody else took all those notes and they started leafing through them and they noticed that there was a, a, a running theme with all his meditations and that was on the character of God. And then somebody turned around or maybe he himself turned around and organized them into the particular attribute that was being talked about. And then the point is that, uh, that those two volumes that are just w w wonderful expositions of, of the Word of God on the, on the character and the attributes and the nature of God came out of his meditations. Simply just came out of his morning devotions, if you want to call it that. So what does meditation do? What's the benefit of it? If you want to know God, you've got to meditate. Remember Proverbs 18.10 says that you know, the Lord's name is... Uh, is like a tower and those who are righteous run to it. The Lord's name, name, which points to his character, is like, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, a, a analogy, metaphor, is like a strong tower. A strong tower is what the t you find in the middle of a city that's surrounded by walls. It's the, the highest point. So when the enemies come, you come into the, into the, the uh, castle area. You come into the city. The walls are closed. But you just don't get behind the wall. You find the, the tower, you find the building, the tallest building, and you run up to the top. And obviously, uh, the proverb is saying that, that that's what, that's what it's, the Lord's name is like. And then I love the next verse. Those who are righteous run to it. In other words, when trouble comes, it's innate of the righteous that they go straight there. Because they know God. They have meditate on God. They know his name. So they go straight to, to the top, so to speak. Look at verse 11 of Psalm 119. Here's a, another benefit. He says, I have treasured up your word, where? In my heart. And remember in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, heart equals mind. So you can say, I have treasured up your word in my mind. And why has he done this? In order that I might not sin against you. You, you want to not fall into temptation? You want to resist temptation? Well, you need to store up, treasure up the word in your mind. Literally, just what treasuring up means is you're, you're just loading up your conscience. Remember, we mentioned it this morning. We'll talk more about conscience next week. The conscience is, is, is really God's gift to you, the rudder of the soul, as someone says. It either excuses you or accuses you on, on whether you do something right or do something wrong. Um, but how do you know if it's right or wrong? You, you load up your mind with truth. You meditate on scripture. All that scripture is sitting in there, treasuring it up. So when you have to make a decision, you know whether to do it or not to do it because why? You, you know the will of God in that moment. Does that make sense? Meditation stores up, it treasures up God's word in the mind in order that when temptation comes, boy, it's not even a, it's not even a, you're not even deliberating on it. You're running like Joseph. Remember, Joseph fled when he was tempted. Here's another one. And we've moved from Psalm 119, but... Uh, on the heels of what we just said, if you want to make just wise decisions in, in general, say nothing of facing temptation. Who to marry, what job to take. I mean, young people have a, a list of decisions that they have to make in their early age, and, and not just early age, young age, even throughout our whole life. 
You want to make biblical decisions. You want to make wise decisions. I mean, it'd be nice, nice to, as I always say, to have the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night so that guy can just lead me. This is where I want to go. That's where I want to go. Or even Gideon, throw out a fleece. So God, you know, show me a sign if I should do this or do that. That's not how it works anymore. I believe the way we know the will of God is through wisdom. Wisdom is knowing the will of God. It's also seeking older and wiser counsel. It, there is a sense where you put everything out on the table. Uh, obviously, choice A is okay and choice B is okay. But what choice do I make? That's going to take wisdom. Having the word of God in your head, in your mind, meditating on that will help you with that. And remember Proverbs 3. What does Proverbs 3, 5, and 7 say? Trust not. What? Don't trust yourself, but trust in, in God. In fact, there, there in Proverbs 3, it says, know God. In all your ways, know God. Take it to God. And he'll what? Make your path straight. What about Daniel? Remember Daniel? That's a good example. Daniel is, is, is taken to Babylon, probably a teenager, him and his three friends, but there's obviously more, these young boys from Judah of the royal family, and, and the whole idea was to indoctrinate them, uh, to make them Babylonians, so, you know, they, they teach them the language, they even change their names, um, and then they came to the point of, of feeding them the, that particular food, and remember, Daniel said, oh, way am I going to eat this food? And most of us probably think, well, that's because most, most of the food was sacrificed to, to the gods before they were given to the boys. And, of course, I'm not going to eat sacrificed food. We don't have any evidence for that. That's, it could be, but that's probably not what it was. Most likely, Daniel and the, and the boys were given food that was not kosher. The, the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the law was very, very particular on what kind of foods you ate. And so probably the food was not part of what they could, were allowed to eat. What did Daniel do? What, did his, what does the text say? He, what? I love this. He purposed in his heart. That is, he, he fixed his mind that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies nor with the wine. In other words, this was a, a conscious decision. He purposed in his heart. He set his mind upon the matter. I can't defile myself. I know what the word of God says. I know what the word of God says. He's chewed on that, no pun intended, over the years. And so when he came to the point where he had to make a decision, it was not even a decision. He's purposed in his heart. I'm not going to do that. So the point is meditation guarded his mind for purity. And I wish young people today would learn that. Real quick, let me just give you a few others and we'll wrap this up. I think you're getting the idea. Meditation keeps our eyes on Christ. Meditation keeps us sincere and honest. Meditation protects us from our spiritual enemies. I mean, we have a lot of defensive armor. Remember Ephesians 6, but we only have one offensive weapon, and that's what? The sword of the Spirit, right? We need to know how to use it. You go into battle, you better know how to use a gun. And if you were living back in those days, you better know how to use a sword because that's what they use. Meditation fights error and builds discernment. The, the, the world outside, it, 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 and we, I think we said it last week, everybody has a worldview. Everybody has a particular ideology of where they came from, where they're going, and, and, and their own little philosophy how to live. And, and Paul talks about that as fortresses, remember, in 2 Corinthians 10? He says, you know, we have a job. Our, our, our job is to come in and crash these fortresses, these, these walls that these people build up. And they build up with what? Error. And, and it's interesting that word for fortress can be translated uh, as fortress, but it also can be translated as prison, and it can also be translated as tomb. And that's the idea of what most people, they build up these walls, and they have no idea that they think it's a fortress, and then they stay in it for all their life as a prisoner, and they ultimately rot in that, in their own tomb. And Paul says, we, we, have a, 
we have a, we have a mission. That mission is to come and, and, and hammer these walls, these fortresses down, anything that's raised up against the knowledge of God, and we do that with what? what any, the only thing that fights error is truth. So you better know the truth. If you want to fight error, if you want to build discernment, past Christmas I saw my um, brother-in-law, and I think I've told you over the years, he's a, he, he works for the Secret Service. Um, he's, he's guarded Obama, he's guarded Trump, um, and thankfully they shipped him over to London so he didn't have to guard the last four years of whoever's in there now. But um, now he's back in Jacksonville. Um, but if you know anything about the Secret Service, it's not just guarding the president. One of the, they, they have a lot of other jobs. In fact, he went over to London because he, 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 he um, got a name for himself on um, tracking down uh, cyber crimes. And since all the cyber crimes really happen over in Europe, mostly in Russia, sorry, that, that he had to be in London in order to kind of liaise with everybody. That's over, he's back. But counterfeit money, counterfeit currency, is, you probably understood, is a big deal. Um, the Secret Service are in charge of that, tracking down who are printing counterfeit money. Now, how can you tell a, a counterfeit bill to the real thing? What, you know, most people think, well, all you do is you gather all the counterfeit up, you put them in a room, and you just sit there all day, and, you know, look at this counterfeit, this counterfeit, this counterfeit, this counterfeit, thinking that, you know, when one of those counterfeits comes through, you know exactly which one it is. That's not how they t train them. What do they do? They put them in a room, but the only thing they put them in the room with is the real thing. When they, they look at the real thing and they, they, you know, all the little writing and the, just, just, I don't know if you've ever looked at a dollar bill and even the currency here in Australia. I mean, what they put on there, um, pretty sophisticated stuff. But the idea is that you, you look at it and you meditate on it and chew over it so that when the false money comes in, just like that, you, oh, you know the real thing so well that you, you just, the, 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 the counterfeit comes, you, you know it's a counterfeit right away. That's, that's how we fight error and build discernment. You know the word of God, you meditate on the word of God. By the way, meditation, if you practice it as it should be practiced, it should give you uh, an appetite for truth. It should just create an, an appetite where you want more truth. Well, let's circle back to where we began. You want to mortify the flesh. You want to get rid of the sin in your life. You want to push the darkness out and bring light. Well, uh, by the Spirit of God, but it's the Word of God in the hands of the Spirit of God that's going to be doing this. You need to understand meditation. Isaiah 26, 3, you will, this is Isaiah speaking to God, you will keep him, him, put your name there, in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you. So maybe we should end with that one. You want just to be happy. You want peace. You want comfort. It begins with meditation. You will keep him in perfect peace. Only, you could say, whose mind is stayed on you. That's meditation. Staying on you. And what does it bring? It brings perfect peace. And again, the key is biblical meditation. Meditation keeps our eyes on Christ. Meditation is, brings wisdom, brings discernment, brings zeal, uh, equips us for evangelism. Again, the list can go on and on and on. It is God's means with the enablement of the Holy Spirit for us to mortify sin and pursue holiness. So hopefully you got it. Hopefully that speaks your interest. Let me, real quick before I close, just pull out a, a few books that if it does pique your interest and you want to follow up on this. This to me is the best introduction on the Puritans in meditation. It's called God's Battle Plan for the Mind by David Saxton. It came out just a few years ago. 
Uh, the subtitle is The Puritan Practice of Biblical Meditation. It's not a th thick book, but if you want to understand um, just definition and the benefits, plus other things, some, uh, obviously moving on from what we've talked about tonight, he, he did an in-depth study. I think this is his published master's thesis from memory. Um, and just introducing Puritan meditation. Um, and, and like I said, going a little bit further than uh, what we've said tonight by way of introduction. But if you want to read the Puritans yourselves, um, this one is a classic. It's by Nathaniel Rano. I don't know how you say the last name. R-A-N-E-W, Rano. Solitude improved by divine meditation. Uh, I remember years ago listening to a guy by the name of John Gerstner, some of that you might know who that name is. He's the guy that taught um, R.C. Sproul. Our, our, our John Gerstner said, you know, I, I, go to a, I go to an airport and I, you know, I sit there and I wait for my plane. I, I just don't sit there and look around and look at everybody. I'm not going to waste any time. I meditate. Uh, because that was the Puritan. The Puritans, had a, the Puritans had an 11th commandment, and that was thou shalt not waste time. And so what do you do if you're not actually actively doing something, you practice divine meditation. That's why it's called solitude by yourself. How do you improve that time by divine meditation? And then Thomas Watson, some of you are familiar with the Puritan Thomas Watson. He seems to be one of everybody's favorite. He's, he's one of mine. He wrote a, a treatise on meditation. It's called The Christian on the Mount. And so you'll get some, some help from that as well. There's other books, but that's, that, that's a start. Come up and have a peek of these if, if you want afterwards. But again, I can't commend to you enough the importance of biblical meditation. So hopefully you got some of that tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, helping us understand just practically how to deal with life and life's issues and, and even to obey our obligations, our duties and commands. And it seems to circle back to uh, the spiritual means that you've given us to, to accomplish all those, and that's by the Spirit, but with the, with the Word of God in the hands of the Spirit of God. And so we know that the Spirit will do His work, but we need to do our work. And part of that work is meditating and knowing how to meditate and how to use our meditation in the usefulness of everything we talked about. So commend this to us. Help us to... Uh, practice it, even learn more about it, so we can be more like Christ. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.